Hello again. It's your boy here to do some learning. Uh, today we're going to be talking about blockchain and cryptocurrency, uh, a, space, a space that's very much front and center in popular media these days. What the hell is a blockchain, and why is it such a big deal? What does that have to do with cryptocurrency? What exactly is Bitcoin, and should I get me some? We'll be getting into that and more today, including how to get your hands on some cryptocurrency, if you should be so inclined. Just so we're clear, we're going over the basics here in terms of technology and terminology. Uh, there's definitely an ocean of depth beneath everything we talk about today, and even though this video is mad long, we're really just taking a surface tour here. Before we start, just a quick disclaimer that I am not a financial advisor, and this is purely educational material. Always do your own research. That being said, let's jump right in. Section 1, Blockchain Structure. So the first thing we're going to have to explain here is the very concept of a blockchain. To do that, we'll start with some really, really basic business concepts. Let's say that we have a small business that sells uh, widgets. Novel example here, I know, but uh, sue me. The sale itself, of course, entails you giving the customer however many widgets they want in return for however much money they cost. Pretty simple. Now, on top of this, depending on what kind of business you have, you may have all manner of other expenses and or streams of revenue. Maybe you don't just sell widgets, you also service and repair those widgets for your customers when needed. Maybe you insure those widgets. Maybe you run a brick and mortar shop for which you have a fixed amount of overhead, uh, which might include electricity costs, various utility costs other than that, and property taxes, etc. You probably want to keep track of all this, right? In fact, you're likely legally obligated to keep track of a lot of these, as you're going to want that information on hand come tax time. And if you're a publicly traded company, your balance sheet and a good bit of uh, detail about your operations are going to need to be readily accessible as you'll be reporting your financials during your earnings calls, and the SEC won't be happy if you lie or mislead to investors. A short story here is that businesses have to keep track of their transactions, and those transactions are a part of the larger business. The larger the business, the more they have to keep track of. This is what give, brings us to the idea of a ledger. Basically, you write the shit down. For our purposes, we're going to focus on the transactions themselves, as that's mainly what blockchains are used for these days. Uh, you might be asking yourself why we even mention those other aspects outside of the transactions if we're not going to be focusing on them. Like I said, we'll, we'll be getting to that part a little later. Blockchains are and what they're used for are evolving by the day. So back to trading widgets for money. I give widget and receive money. We reduce the number of widgets in my inventory by one and add uh, one dollar to my gross revenue. Now, note that this one dollar might come in the form of cash, uh, some fiat currency, or it might come in the form of credit. Both cases involve some intermediary, like a bank or PayPal or Cash App, etc. So then where are the details of that transaction recorded? There's a few options when it comes to ledgers, and it usually depends on what kind or size of business is doing the selling. One thing that might have jumped into your mind when I started talking about this is probably something in the lines of uh, Microsoft Excel. And that's one option, a spreadsheet. That's nice if you're an individual or small group of people. For businesses operating on a larger scale, that's unlikely to be enough. When we're talking about those large organizations, we're typically thinking about databases. These are fundamentally designed differently because they're designed to be accessed by multiple individuals and store multiple types of information that can be filtered and manipulated easily. Usually that's going to require multiple powerful server computers working in a network. An important thing to note about these servers is that they are owned by a single entity and are thus centralized, so to speak. Going back for a moment to the issue of how transactions are carried out, which I touched on seconds ago, uh, most electronic business transactions are carried out with some form of intermediary. I'm going to go ahead and read a section of the Bitcoin white paper that lays out this issue better than I possibly could, and we'll pick through it and, simplifies the, and simplify the words of the great Satoshi Nakamoto. Completely non-reversible transactions are not really possible, since financial institutions cannot avoid mediating disputes. The cost of mediation increases transaction costs, limiting the minimum practical transaction size and cutting off the possibility for small casual transactions. 
And there's a broader cost in the loss of ability to make non-reversible payments for non-reversible services. With the possibility of reversal, the need for trust spreads. Merchants must be wary of their customers, hassling them for more information than they would otherwise need. A certain percentage of fraud is accepted as unavoidable. These costs and payment uncertainties can be avoided in person by using physical currency. But no mechanism exists to make payments over a communications channel without a trusted party. Basically, the fact that there's a third party involves, involved imposes some inherent restrictions on how transactions are carried out. That third party is going to have fees and that's going to raise costs. If baseline cost to carry out a transaction is higher, then why on earth would I sell something that doesn't cost enough? So say, hypothetically, that PayPal charges a $1 fee to make a certain transaction happen using a MasterCard number. Why then would I use that service to sell my $1 widget? That doubles the cost of my widget by default uh, if I were to keep my profit margins the same. And if the intermediary is responsible for the possibility uh, to reverse a transaction, uh, then, the one, then the onus then goes to the seller a bit in order to ensure that there is no reason to reverse the transaction and cut into their margins. The customer might not like having to do more in the way of proving their financial, and, th and that might deter some people. If reversing a transaction is even possible, it becomes harder to accept ePay for irreversible services like, say, surgery, as any significant rate of reversal, for instance related to fraud, would potentially be a big hit. We go back to Satoshi one more time. What is needed is an electric payments, electronic payment system based on cryptographic proof instead of trust, allowing any two willing parties to transact directly with each other without the need for a trusted third party. Transactions that are computationally impractical to reverse would protect sellers from fraud and routine escrow mechanisms could easily be implemented to protect buyers. In this paper, we propose a solution to the double spending problem, using a peer-to-peer -peer distributed timestamp server to generate computational proof of the chronological order of transactions. The system is secure as long as honest nodes collectively control more CPU power than any cooperating group of attacker nodes. Don't worry too much about the technobabble at the end of that. We'll go over it a little later. The basic idea here is that is just that the huge opportunity for improving e-commerce is removing the need for third parties. On top of that, the mechanism we use to do this needs to be secure enough that we can trust it to verify and enable transactions consistently. He also brings up the so-called double spending problem, which we'll hear about a couple times in this video. If you have $30 in the bank, you can't withdraw $60 just by hit clicking transfer twice or otherwise playing with the system. Alternatively, you can't use an amount of fiat currency with a debit or a credit card m multiple times to fraudulently pay for something you otherwise couldn't afford, which could lead to a transaction that has to be reversed. Bitcoin and cryptocurrencies in general, at the very least, need to offer a solution to this problem, and that solution is blockchain. Blockchains are like server ledgers, but they are structured in unique ways. Let's, talk, let's start by breaking down the word itself. Blockchain, a portmanteau of block and chain. At its most basic, this word actually describes the structure of a blockchain. The basic unit is a block, and a block is a list of records. A block, or collection of information that we're going to put into our ledger, typically consists of a few standard elements. Data, hash, previous hash, and metadata consisting of a timestamp and block number. In short, these blocks of information are then chained together and distributed to every node in the network that comprises the chain. I just listed a bunch of stuff that you're not probably, you know, familiar with the terminology, so let's, let's go into detail on some of that. What, we're what we were describing before, I gave you one widget for one dollar, is the data I want on the blockchain. Those other elements, hash, previous hash, metadata, are what allow me to assign that data a unique home on the blockchain. Say that I have my own blockchain, a uh, widget chain, and the so-called genesis block, the first block on the chain, uh, is that one widget for a dollar transaction. This block will have what's called a hash. What is a hash? 
Uh, it's essentially a unique string of characters that functions as an identifier for the data on that block. It's literally something like this. That, by the way, is the actual hash of a block on the Bitcoin blockchain. Why do we use hashes? The process of hashing is actually a cryptographic operation that takes the data we're putting on the blockchain and outputs a specific string. Some basic features of a hash are radical uniqueness, uh, my term. Each output is unique, and changing a little of the input changes the whole output. Consistency, uh, the same output is always produced for a single input. And unidirectionality, so because you can't get the input back out by using the output hash. You could theoretically do this with the entire data content of the internet. So as we said, each block will have its own hash, and the hash of its so-called parent block, which came before it. If you wanted to change data in that second block, you'd also have to change the parent block as well. Also, the block's metadata and previous hash can actually be inputs alongside its own data to generate its hash. This is important to understand, as this is part of how blockchains become trustworthy over time. It would be easy to change things if there were only a few blocks, but once we get to where, for instance, Bitcoin is right now, where it's approaching 685,000 blocks, it becomes highly impractical, if not impossible, to actually change the information in the chain. The metadata also plays a part insofar as it tells us, chronologically, when that block was verified and brought onto the chain and which number block it is. For now, we'll stick uh, to those basics, but know that there's a lot of stuff below this surface level of explanation, like how verification can be done more efficiently, utilizing Merkle trees, etc. Uh, I may make a video delving into some of that stuff later, but this isn't really the place for it. Short story here. Hashes are required for a block to be considered valid on the blockchain, and should be a clear line of and there should be a clear line of hashes leading all the way back to the genesis block on the chain. You might be wondering at this point what Bitcoin's genesis block consists of. Here it is. The data basically says that the Times, January 3rd, 2009, Chancellor on brink of second bailout for banks. And this is the hash. And pretty much, note that this isn't even a transaction, just a string of texts. Uh, we'll come back to that point. Blockchains are decentralized slash distributed, immutable, high capacity, consensus based, private slash pseudonymous, and highly secure. When it comes right down to it, these other factors come together to make a blockchain secure. So everything we're talking about contributes to security in some form, and beyond that, Individual cryptocurrencies will have their own unique security measures on top of these basics. One term that you're likely to hear if you look up blockchains is decentralized. Remember how we said traditional databases are centralized? The simple explanation is uh, here is exactly what you're likely thinking already. The blockchain is distributed across multiple computers. Ideally, these things are large networks and copies of the blockchain exist in each participating computer or node in the network, right? Uh, not all blockchains are truly decentralized, but a lot of the major ones like Bitcoin and Ethereum are. Each node or computer in the network that participates in the, in the blockchain um, can use the other nodes to correct itself and the chain of information with the largest amount of consensus is considered correct by the algorithm. This concept can be paired with the progressive immutability characteristic we described earlier when we went over hashes. You could potentially get enough computing power to change every block's data at once. But in a decentralized network with copies of the legitimate blockchain information, even if you did that, you wouldn't be able to corrupt the chain as there's a bunch of other computers that know the real story. The protocol will check for updates, pinpoint the error, and your attack attempt is foiled. Now, you could conceive of a situation as well where not only have you changed every block, you've also gathered enough computing power to con constitute a majority or 51% of the blockchain's power. And then you could potentially make changes with impunity. This is called a 51% attack. And we'll go over that in our section about how to attack the blockchain in part two. The distributed nature of blockchains are a big part of what con con contributes to their high capacity. Simply having a system working on a thousand computers, each with their own capacity, 
each contributing that capacity to the network, is much more powerful than any single computer working alone. The privacy aspect of blockchains is also very important. What implementing this is in the form of cryptocurrencies, uh, this aspect is variably emphasized. Some cryptocurrencies, like Monero, are designed around privacy and anonymity. For the most part, cryptos like Bitcoin are not fully anonymous, but are private as transactions typically are associated with an individual's public key instead of their personal identity information. This provides a measure of disconnection between the user and the transaction they've put on the public ledger, uh, which itself is transparent and visible to all. The sale of one ounce of cocaine for $50 worth of Bitcoin can get put out on the chain, but it isn't you that sold that snow. It was the individual holding the, a certain public key, which is a string that superficially resembles a hash. We'll talk more about public and private keys later when we talk about cryptocurrency and the implementation of blockchains for transactions. Now, the last big concept we'll go over in this section is the concept of consensus. How do we decide that a certain block of data is legit and should be added to the blockchain? In a centralized system, whoever owns the system or is in charge of making these changes pretty much is in charge of adding data. In a blockchain, there might be thousands or hundreds of thousands of nodes, and no individual one of them is in charge of adding the next block. So how does it get done? How does everybody agree on which version of the blockchain to use without using a third party? Well, there's typically some form of what's called a consensus measure mechanism, a way of pro proving the majority of the network that this block we want to add is legitimate. And there's many of these, in fact. We'll detail these shortly in the next part on current cryptocurrency. In brief, new blocks in most blockchains or cryptocurrencies are added uh, either by performing a great deal of cryptographic work that makes it impractical and expensive for bad actors to intervene, which is called proof, proof of work, or by putting a certain amount of crypto coins that you own on the line to participate in adding new blocks to make it expensive and self-defeating for bad actors to intervene which is called proof of, proof of stake. If that doesn't really make sense yet, don't worry. We'll expand on these ideas in part two, as I was saying, as these are pretty important properties of what makes uh, many cryptocurrencies what they are. For now, we just need to be clear on the idea that if we've gone to this much trouble to avoid having to trust the other party, uh, making everything public, using hashes to verify blocks, decentralizing the whole network, etc., we can't mess up when it comes to adding new blocks to the blockchain. The two main kinds of strategy net strategies that networks have leveraged are the cryptographic and game theory routes, like I was saying. You either make things extremely complicated and work intensive to mess with, or you impose a condition of participating in block ver verification such that any damage you do onto the blockchain, you also do onto your own wallet. The number of blocks linked in a blockchain constitutes the height of that blockchain. Each individual block has a block number uh, or block height which signifies its distance from the genesis block, which is block zero. Okay, last thing we're going to get into in this section is the concept of keys, a concept that's central to understanding how we transact with and move around cryptocurrencies. Private keys and public keys. A private key in crypto is a 256 megabyte number that allows coins to be unlocked and sent. So private keys are mostly about sending. This number allows you to move coins out of your wallet. That's why you got to keep them private. You keep it private because, like I said, without that number, nobody, including you, can take money away from where you keep it. Public keys are like that, except they allow your coins to be locked and received. Your crypto is going to have both private and public keys. Now, here's the relationship between them. You can derive a public key from a private key, but not the other way around. This is achieved by a complex cryptographic means that I, frankly, am not specialized enough to understand or explain. Apparently, there's a cryptographic function involving something called the SECP 256K1 elliptic curve that allows the generation of these keys using randomly selected points on the curve. Uh, don't worry about that. You really just have to be familiar with how to use these. When you make a crypto wallet and they give you a sequence of random words that they'll tell you to write down and never show anybody, that sequence of words is basically functioning as a seed input to allow the algorithm to generate your unique wallet address, 
which functions just like key generation. Those words are like the word equivalents of private keys. You may have heard the phrase, not your keys, not your coins, popularized by Andreas Antonopoulos. Now, he was actually referring specifically to Bitcoin, but this is a pretty popular concept. Now, let's take a second to explore that. The type of situation that this refers to is like with exchanges like Coinbase or indirect systems like the current setup of Robinhood Crypto. Robinhood Crypto isn't currently like other exchanges that allow you to export coins to other exchanges uh, or your own wallets. Basically, if you buy crypto on Robinhood, you're really just buying a stake in their stockpile of coins. They have a stockpile, and if you have $100 worth of Dogecoin, uh, you kind of own the value of however many uh, coins that money got you. Currently, you can only take out the value in the form of fiat currency and are unable to move uh, that to other exchanges or wallets or pay for anything with it, uh, thus eliminating opportunities for things like crypto arbitrage or, or staking, uh, at least directly anyway. Robinhood crypto is only for speculation at the moment, but they do say they want to make it a fully functional crypto wallet as soon as possible, whatever that means. Part of the fundamental philosophy of cryptocurrency is to take power away from centralized authorities. When you don't have the private keys that you identify uh, your own coins with and allow you to send and receive your own coins, we'll talk more detail about that later, uh, you are allowing someone else to hold your money and that requires trust and introduces new risk. If they get hacked, you can lose your money. If they go down for maintenance or otherwise freeze trading for some reason, you lose control at a potentially inopportune time. So all that sounds pretty darn good, right? Well, it is. But there's disadvantages and challenges too. And the video wouldn't be complete if we didn't talk about those as well. So here we go. First, a drawback to proof of work consensus coins is that work, measured in hash rate, is what is needed to add new blocks. What is needed to, what is needed to prove work? Energy. So as the blockchain gets higher, there's more work invol validating, involved in validating the next block. More work means more energy. And where this energy comes from has been the source of much hullabaloo lately. If you've been paying any attention to news in the crypto space lately, uh, lately being May 2021, uh, you're definitely going to hear about how Elon Musk dissed Bitcoin for driving a massive, uh, for driving a massive rise in non-renewable energy use. Now, there's more to that particular issue than what he's saying, but that gets back to what we're talking about here. Proof of work requires progressively more work, and therefore more energy over time to keep raising the blockchain higher. And so they specifically present an energy barrier. Later in the video, we'll go over how proof of stake potentially provides an answer to this, and allow some cryptos like Algorand and Cardano to aim for carbon neutrality and even carbon negativity. Given that proof of work is, at the moment, technically the most time-tested and battle-proven secure consensus mechanism in many people's eyes, many have criticized this approach as trading off security from a technical standpoint. Next, when it comes to using blockchains as infrastructure for transactions, their speed often tends to be an issue, more so with earlier generation blockchains or cryptos. For example, Bitcoin can only handle 7 transactions per second, or TPS. Its block time, the time it takes to add a new block to the chain, is about 10 minutes. In other words, if you want to go to a store and buy something with Bitcoin in person, you got to wait 10 minutes to finalize that. In comparison, Visa can handle 1700 TPS and MasterCard can handle five, about 5000. Your credit card doesn't take 10 minutes uh, to work for a reason. Now, that's using Bitcoin as an example. Various other coins uh, have their solutions to this problem, but often this comes at the expense of their decentralization. Currently, crypto cards uh, with companies like Vizo aren't actually cards that are letting you spend Bitcoin or something like that directly at the store. Crypto credit cards are essentially just regular credit cards that offer crypto instead of fiat rewards. Unfortunately, some of the ones available don't necessarily award you in one of the more valuable cryptocurrencies like Bitcoin. Uh, so, there's that. Uh, crypto debit cards are prepaid cards that can be loaded with crypto that's first converted into fiat currency like the US dollar. 
A lot of these come with proof of stake requirement, though, so watch out for that. One thing that's pointed to pretty often about cryptocurrency is the fact that a lot of it is used for illicit activity. As of 2019, the ratio of dollars used for illicit activity to Bitcoin used for illicit activity, according to Masari, was 800 to 1. According to the DEA, between 2013 and 2018, only about 10% of Bitcoin specifically was used for illicit activity like buying drugs. Your money is already used for illicit activity and in higher volumes. That's all I'm really going to say on the matter is this just strikes me as an overtly weak argument. Who cares? Now, you may have noticed that solving some of these problems sometimes involves trade-offs with other aspects of blockchain technology that investors are drawn by. Although I'll note that this isn't always necessarily the case. This uh, bind has been characterized by some. Originally, Vitalik Buterin? Vitaly Buterin? Buterin? I don't know how to say that name. Of Ethereum founder fame uh, as the blockchain trilemma. The three competing interests of the trilemma are scalability, decentralization, and security. How should we think of and measure these things? Decentralization manifests in many ways. We can look at things like number of miners, number of full nodes, geographic distribution, number of active developers, etc. It keeps the blockchain resistant to censorship. Scalability, kind of like it sounds, is about blockchains maintaining performance in the face of mass adoption. No one using a blockchain that crumbles the moment people start uh, actually using it is actually going to be happy with that blockchain. This is seen as maximum throughput measured by transactions per second. Security is about the irrevocability of transactions. An ideal blockchain for everyday use, uh, en masse, is one that scales to support thousands of transactions per second while being extremely hard to attack or, or enact fraud upon, and at the same time maintaining complete decentralization. Why is this such an issue? Earlier, when I mentioned that Bitcoin now only supports seven transactions per second, many of you may have been confused. That doesn't really seem like a lot, and a 10-minute block time seems overtly suboptimal if we were to ever use it as a currency. Was this a fundamentally technical issue that they couldn't overcome? Well, not really. In fact, the decision to slow things down was intentional, a way of allowing for multiple miners to verify each transaction as a trust-minimizing measure. This was a case of scalability being sacrificed for decentralization. Now, remember earlier we said work was measured in hash rate? The more hash power a proof-of-work blockchain has, the more secure it is as the more energy is actually used to verify new blocks. If the hash rate goes up, security goes up. And at the same time, because we're generating new hashes for blocks faster, speed and thus scalability also go up. So, in general, the idea is that scalability and security are directly proportionally to each other, but inversely proportional to decentralization. A big reason why Visa and MasterCard systems are so fast is simply that they are centralized third parties, and that double spending issue we introduced near the beginning just isn't a big deal to them. With their central authority and the knowledge and power that come with that, they can make their networks run very quickly. However, this requires us to trust them and exposes us to counterparty risk in, in large numbers if ever someone were to attack them, hence the introduction of cryptocurrency. We're going to revisit this shortly in the crypto parts Ethereum subsection when we talk about gas fees, as this is essentially why they've run into a scalability issue as they continue to prioritize decentralization. In order to deal with growing adoption and thus network demands in a proof-of-work environment, the most obvious solutions typically involve reducing the number of miners verifying a given transaction, which would compromise decentralization, or reducing block time, uh, usually by requiring less work and thus compromising security. Bitcoin's scalability answer is a layer 2 solution called Lightning, and Ethereum is basically overhauling everything to address this, switching to proof of stake and introducing all manner of complicated shenanigans like sharding and the beacon chain. More on those when we talk about specific cryptocurrencies. Section 1. Cryptocurrency Aims and Properties So we just talked about blockchain technology. Now, what exactly is this being used for? 
Well, the idea is that we'd like to use it as an infrastructure for money or something close to money or, as we'll see a little later, other things. What is money? Well, let's take a moment to define money by way of its classical functions in the way that we see it with traditional fiat currency. Now, fiat currency is attached to, you know, governments. So strictly speaking, cryptocurrency is not like fiat currency as far as money. Money is a store of value, a medium of exchange, and a unit of account. What makes something a good store of value? It has to be reliably stored, saved, and retrieved. Now, during that time that your money is stored or saved, you'd want it to retain a stable value, therefore allowing retrieval to happen comfortably without realizing losses pretty much whenever. Stores of value are most meaningful when they can also be used as media of exchange once retrieved. What makes something a good medium of exchange? Pretty straightforward, this means that you can use it to acquire goods and services. Adoption is a decent measure of this. The US dollar is at the moment the best medium of exchange in the world as it's accepted by more businesses than any other currency. What makes something a good unit of account? This one's a bit more involved. A currency should be divisible into smaller units, like dollars can be split into cents or bitcoin can be split into satoshis, without loss of value. It should be fungible, meaning that 100 cents is equivalent to one dollar, which is equivalent to four quarters, and each of these is nominally equivalent units uh, is interchangeable. And it should be countable. In other words, you should be able to directly perform mathematical operations on it, like subtraction, addition, and multiplication, and so forth. So, taking a look at, again, Bitcoin as our example here, we see that it's really not a widely used medium of exchange at the moment, but it is a reasonable store of value and has the fundamentals required to serve as a unit of account. It is fungible, countable, divisible, and can be used to acquire goods and services as long as the business accepts BTC as payment. More businesses are accepting BTC, but it's not exactly like you can go to Kroger and get your weekly grocery haul in Bitcoin. When it comes to storing value, there are pros and cons. You can store BTC in wallets securely. You can retrieve them and sell them on exchanges for fiat currency. However, how much you can sell at one, one time successfully will depend on trading volume. That won't commonly be a problem for most people, but for larger institutions with millions of coins, it can be. Another issue with BTC as a store of value is the volatility of its price. One can, and perhaps should, make the argument that BTC has performed very well as a long-term asset, and thus has excellent store of value. But the volatility can make short-term store of value a little iffy. Right now, we're going through a pretty good 50% plus correction in Bitcoin. And for a lot of people, that may make them feel very hesitant about retrieving any of their money, as they feel they'd either be realizing losses or leaving large gains on the table. When we talk about things like crypto, tokens, and coins, we have to be clear on some terms. BTC is the native token of the Bitcoin blockchain. ETH is the native token of the Ethereum blockchain. DAI, LINK, and MANA are tokens that are built on the Ethereum network. Uh, these tokens utilize the underlying Ethereum blockchain, but their values are independent of the value of ETH. Now, there's a few more properties of cryptos that you'll want to be familiar with before you wander out into the market to hodl some coins. So why don't we start with something we've already mentioned multiple times, consensus mechanisms. The two major ones to know about are proof of work and proof of stake. In explaining these, we'll touch on the idea of mining and minting, and we'll look into where exactly crypto miners factor into the development of blockchains. If you search around, you'll find systems that are hybrids of these, uh, proof of activity. You'll find uh, proof of assignment, proof of burn, proof of capacity, proof of elapsed time, proof of authority. Forget these, nobody cares. Uh, it's just kidding, but uh, not really. These are typically used by a lot of smaller altcoins and aren't as important, at least for the time being, to understanding the modern crypto landscape. Let's start with proof of work. Proof of work utilizes miners, which are nodes that participate in verifying new nodes. Each of these nodes, or computers in the network, are doing work in the form of cryptographic computations, energy-intensive puzzles that need increasingly more computer power to solve. 
These puzzles are what's called asymmetric cryptographic operations, which in this case means they're very hard to solve, but very easy and quick to verify if they've been solved correctly. Almost reminiscent of how you can get a public key from a private key, but not the other way around. These puzzles are energy intensive because they're inherently guess and check in their nature. So therefore, if you want to solve it faster, you need more computational power. The difficulty of these puzzles is dynamic depending on the chain's block time. If miners are solving too quickly, they get harder, and if miners aren't solving fast enough, they get easier. Miners are rewarded for their work, often in the form of the coins they're mining, which is why they participate in the first place. Bitcoin, BTC, Dogecoin, Doge, and currently Ethereum, ETH, use proof of work. Ethereum will soon transition to proof of stake and use ETH2 as their coin. Proof of work, as the consensus mechanism used by Bitcoin, like I said earlier, is the oldest and most tested at scale consensus mechanism. Next, we have proof of stake. Proof of work wants to achieve security by requiring lots of work and energy to verify a block, therefore imposing a large energy cost toward attacking a blockchain using its own processes. Proof of stake goes more in the direction of game theory, instead of requiring nodes to have a stake in the blockchain to participate in what's called minting. Instead of mining and miners that mine new coins, like proof of work, proof of stake uses minters or validators that mint new coins by staking a certain quantity of coins or tokens to verify new blocks. Unlike with proof of work, you can't participate or attack the network without owning part of it. Typically, the process of deciding who gets to mint the next block is random. However, staking more coins typically means a higher probability of being chosen to mint a block. Validators, like miners, are rewarded for their work. Binance, BNB, Algorand, Algo, Solana Sol, Polkadot Dot, and Stellar Lumens XLM are examples of coins that use proof of stake. There's variants of these like delegated proof of stake and pure proof of stake used by EOS and Algorand. Now let's talk about layers. As you venture out into the crypto space, you're going to hear a lot about layer one and layer two, and you might even hear about more layers. Cryptocurrencies, like ogres and onions, have layers. We don't necessarily have a universal agreement on how many layers there are, but we mostly know what people mean when they talk about layers one and two. Some people say that the hardware used for blockchains should be considered layer zero. Some put decentralized applications, or dApps, in their own layer. There's more than one way of conceptualizing the concept of crypto layers. Most of what we just spent a bunch of time describing, blockchain setups, consensus mechanisms, is what people refer to as layer one. What we've covered gives you a decent understanding of mainstream cryptos like BTC and ETH, but there's a lot more you can do in layer one. Basic Attention Tokens Layer 1 is built around a browser called Brave, and its coins are set up around catering to advertisers and content creators. Algorand's Layer 1 is very focused on large-scale decentralized finance. Decentraland is literally an augmented reality game, video game with a browser version that houses NFTs that can be bought and sold with their MANA token. When you go to a cryptocurrency's website, read their mission statement, and go through how they address that mission, for the most part, you're basically reading about their Layer 1 strategy. Layer 2 pretty much describes any framework or protocol that overlies Layer 1. That's a pretty vague concept, so let's flesh it out. Layer 2 solutions are typically meant to address scaling and speed issues that Layer 1 might run into. Remember when we were talking about scalability difficulties and how Bitcoin can only handle 7 TPS? There's a Layer 2 solution called Lightning Network, that's trying to address this by using something called state channels to allow users to transact off-chain, and then the Lightning Network reports that to the Bitcoin blockchain. This way, you don't have to change the Layer 1 blockchain, which would be prohibitively difficult, but you can still speed up transactions by moving them off-chain. Since the data is added to Layer 1 using the usual mechanisms, security is preserved. Raiden Network does something similar for Ethereum, but it sounds cooler so it's better. Anyway, the identity of a cryptocurrency is in large part related to the specifics of how its blockchain is set up, which consensus mechanism it uses, and its use cases. 
I wouldn't by any means call this a comprehensive overview, but it's a decent start. Section two, some cryptos and why they might show promise. Okay, so this is the part where I show some coins. Mind you, I do this strictly to provide educational examples about how some of these concepts apply in the real world. Not because I own these coins. I mean, I, I do own all of them, but don't think too hard about that. What we're going to see here is that a lot of projects aren't strictly what you would call cryptocurrency, as being used as currency isn't necessarily the private, primary goal, necessarily. That's more what Bitcoin is doing. Others kind of have this as an ancillary feature, but that's not their real focus. The point of choosing the three coins we're going to go over in this section is to cover a variety of applications of blockchain technology to really give you an idea of what's possible in the modern crypto space. What's not the point of this section is to give a comprehensive overview of these three coins, only the basics so that you can understand what they're trying to do. If you'd like individual breakdowns of some coins, feel free to comment down below and I can do that. Anyway, here we go. Let's do Bitcoin first, as we've kind of already made a good basic description of Bitcoin already. This is the coin that coined, pardon the pun, the idea of cryptocurrency and established one of the blockchain's earliest use cases as a potential replacement for fiat currency. Its layer one is a proof-of-work blockchain whose native coin, BTC, has a capped supply of 21 million. This means that there will never be more than 21 million BTC in circulation, and more BTC are added via mining rewards. At the moment, it functions mostly as a store of value, but it's making inroads with companies that are starting to accept it as payment, giving it the most use out of pretty much every crypto as a medium of exchange. There's actually a surprising number of companies that do accept BTC. PayPal, Microsoft, Tesla, some food chains like Burger King Venezuela, Pizza Hut Venezuela, I wonder why Venezuela, are just a few examples. Actually, scratch Tesla as of right now. Bitcoin is the oldest and most well-known cryptocurrency and thus has the most public engagement and institutional demand. Grayscale has a Bitcoin trust. Kathy Wood's ARK Investments own a crap ton of BTC, as does Chamath Palihapitiya's social capital. Bitcoin is in the news pretty much every day now. About 17% of Americans now own at least a few Satoshis. Upcoming Layer 2 scaling solutions include Lightning Network. You can't pay taxes, except in Switzerland, or take out loans in BTC. So it's not quite like real money just yet, but who knows how that'll go in the future. So far, its all-time high is in the 60k range, but bulls like Kathy Wood think 500,000 is a realistic future price point in the next few years. Next, we have Ethereum. Ethereum is a whole different beast from Bitcoin, which is why it's frustrating that its price correlates so closely with Bitcoins. Ethereum has some of the basic features that Bitcoin has. It runs on a blockchain. It has a native token, uh, or coin in this case, which is called ETH, and uh, Ethereum is the overlying platform, kind of like BTC is the coin for Bitcoin and Bitcoin is the overlying platform. It can serve as a store of value. It has solid social engagement, uh, what with its second highest market cap and broad business exposure. It has potential as a medium of exchange. It's currently proof of work. However, ETH2 will be proof of stake. But honestly, past that we go immediately into differences. It does not have a fixed supply. More, most importantly, Ethereum, the platform, has a feature that pretty much defines it as a second generation cryptocurrency. Smart contracts and the possibility of layer one decentralized applications or dApps that run through what's called the Ethereum virtual machine. This is a big deal. Bitcoin is a store of value with a decade of economic proof. Ether has that, and you can also make programs that run directly on layer one. In other words, the code, once written in either uh, Solidity or Viper programming languages, reside on the blockchain and are executed by the Ethereum virtual machine independent of human control. If you think about it, this is at its base, a way of potentially replacing the entire digital economy as we know it. Every single Amazon transaction could theoretically work as a smart contract on Ethereum. Legal contracts could be enforced by smart contracts. International banking could be facilitated by smart contracts. 
If generation one was essentially proof of concept for blockchains and crypto as a store of value, generation two is proof that we don't need much other than blockchains and crypto uh, for any individual thing. In order to deploy smart contracts, execute them, and do transactions, users of the platform currently have to pay gas fees to miners to add their data to the blockchain. They can pay a premium to speed this up, which by the way is measured in seconds as opposed to Bitcoin's 10 minute block time. As of right now, it has an unlimited monetary policy, like I was saying, with its new Ether being mined without a cap. Businesses accepting Ether as payment include Shopify, Overstock, Cheap Air, and some more. Generally less than BTC at the moment. Layer 2 solutions include Raiden Network and Polygon, which uh, we'll talk about next. Ether's all-time high is almost $4,400. There's a variety of bull cases for Ether based on who you agree with and what your research tells you. Some think uh, 10K ETH is practically guaranteed in 2021. Others think 10K ETH is still a year or two off. Goldman Sachs recently had a leaked internal document saying that they expect the flippening the moment of Ethereum's market cap surpassing Bitcoin's for that number one spot is highly likely within the next few years. Now, note that this means by market cap, not necessarily that the price of an individual Ether will surpass the price of an individual BTC. Now, that all sounds really, really good. But at this point, ETH has run into a bit of a scalability problem. With the network at its current size, with so much data being added to the blockchain, Gas fees have gone up to remarkable levels. It becomes progressively less cost-effective to use the platform. The Ethereum Foundation's answer to this issue is a hard fork, making ETH into ETH2 and making a bevy of large changes to how the platform works. For one, they're going to go proof-of-stake, which should drastically reduce energy costs as work or energy will be required nearly as much uh, to validate new blocks. They're also switching to sharding with the beacon chain. Uh, in other words, they'll be running multiple chains in parallel, parallel to reduce hardware requirements and increase TPS. They're also switching to a system where validators get a block reward and a certain amount of gas will be burned or destroyed and removed from supply, which will decrease supply and make ETH2, if not deflationary, at least disinflationary. If you're interested in uh, looking a little further into the, um, you know, business exposure and stuff like that with ETH, um, I would go look into the uh, Ethereum Enterprise uh, Association uh, and uh, look at which companies are kind of involved in that. There's actually a bunch of investment banks and all of Microsoft Azure runs with Ethereum. Uh, there's, there's actually a surprising amount of exposure and, and momentum when it comes to Ethereum at this point. While we're talking about coins and why they're valuable, let's take a moment to talk about Metcalfe's Law, an idea from computer science uh, that's typically applied to networks like Facebook, but with the advent of cryptocurrency, um, has seen rising application in economics um, toward models of valuing cryptocurrencies like Bitcoin. One fundamental problem some people have with cryptocurrencies is that we don't really have as many hard rules and metrics for valuing crypto um, that we have for like stocks or real estate, uh, which is a fair point. Nobody really has a definitive answer on how best to value cryptos. Metcalfe's law is one potential solution uh, as it states that a network's value is directly proportional to the square of the number of users in the network. Its application in crypto valuation importantly takes into account uh, that despite the supply being fixed in the short term, um, especially with BTC with its hard supply cap, um, demand is not the only factor that affects price as the simple addition of new users is valuable to the network. Any model uh, for crypto valuation uh, should account for both coin supply and creation and user slash wallet number. A more holistic approach uh, for now is probably better, as we'll detail in part three. Uh, for more uh, on Metcalfe's law and a uh, more technical analysis of why it works, see the link in the description. Polygon is a sidechain solution to the scalability problem of Ethereum that also aims to connect it to other blockchains. Founded in India and initially called Matic, 
Polygon allows multiple blockchains to interact with Ethereum while maintaining their own sovereignty. The native token is still called Matic. Everything running through Polygon is finalized on the Ethereum blockchain, but consensus is achieved via proof of stake. Polygon supports the Ethereum virtual machine and allows users to leverage smart contracts. Polygon is essentially a scalability solution that's agnostic of layer one. However, it was built off a solution that was written about by Ethereum founder Vitaly But however the fuck you say that, and Joseph Poon, <laughs> Joseph Poon, uh, who's known for his work on BTC's Lightning Network, uh, that's called Plasma, and improved by the Polygon's founders from a form called More Viable Plasma to what they now called Matic Plasma. The basic idea is that you can use side chains, called child chains, or in Polygon Plasma, commit chains, that have their own blockchain data that are confirmed en masse off the Ethereum main chain before being uploaded all at once to Ethereum. Polygon is trying to branch out as much as possible to other blockchains at this point. As for monetary policy, its Matic token is capped at 10 billion maximum supply. <laughs> Joseph Poon. Uh, Basic Attention Token is a blockchain network built on Ethereum whose native token is called BAT. What's really cool about this one is that the project is centered around a, a web browser called the Brave Browser. The whole system is based around the monetization of user attention while also addressing issues of user privacy and data ownership. By using blockchain technology, the way users interact with advertising can be tracked, allowing for fewer and more targeted ads, the focus there being meant to be fewer. The browser itself automatically blocks invasive cookies, malware, and trackers. You can earn BAT by using the browser to view ads, but only if you choose to, and content creators can benefit from BAT tips if they sign on as a verified creator. It's a relatively new browser, but it's already shown to be faster than every major browser where people are using. The browser is built to protect your privacy, unlike other browsers that actively record your information. Even their private mode is more private than other browsers' private modes. The price of BAT, interestingly, is pegged intrinsically to ETH, one ETH being 6400 BAT. So if you're bullish on ETH, you're bullish on BAT inherently. For a network based on attention, it has ironically low social engagement, but its system of expanding institutional demand by offering increased return on advertisements is gaining traction as organizations like the LA Times, NPR, The Home Depot, Verizon, and thousands more have launched ad campaigns on the network. Brave Browser's active user count has surpassed 25 million at this point and seems to be growing pretty steadily. So that's a few examples of the applications of blockchain technology. But honestly, that's only just scratching the surface. OVR is a coin that's used to purchase virtual land in an augmented reality platform called Overland. MANA is a token built on Ethereum used to buy virtual reality property and buy and sell NFTs. ICP is the token for internet computer which is basically trying to reinvent the internet entirely. Some tokens are governance tokens, others are utility tokens, or transactional tokens, or platform tokens. Each of these have their own intended purposes. If you'd like to see a concentrated videos about any of these coins, including BTC or ETH or Matic, uh, which we've only touched the surfaces of, please let me know in the comments below. Section three, attacking crypto blockchains. Now, you might be wondering with all this techno, techno babble going on and this whole thing being on computers and the internet, there must be technical vulnerabilities, right? What can bad actors do to take advantage of weaknesses in blockchains and why should I care? Let's answer that last one first. There's a variety of weak points where the assets in a cryptocurrency can be attacked and one of those weak points is you, as we'll discuss soon. At the very least, if you're going to get into trading cryptocurrencies, you have to know at least enough not to be the weakness that makes the money in your wallet disappear. What we're about to go over isn't going to be a comprehensive or even particularly detailed overview of how cryptos get attacked, 
but it'll be a place to start. Most of it won't apply to you in your everyday trading, but the part about making yourself less hackable will. Let's first go over ways of attacking the blockchain network itself. We'll start with DDoS attacks or distributed denial of service. We're talking here about people who use multiple connected devices to overload a network with fake or frivolous traffic, making it essentially unusable for its normal functions. This is pretty hard to do to an actual blockchain, so historically these are aimed at websites like crypto exchanges. Bitfinex and OKX have been attacked this way before. This would essentially make it impossible to trade cryptos, potentially leaving people with serious losses during a bear market. More importantly, it might shake investor confidence in the attack networks, leading to a potential drop in use of said network. There's also transaction malleability attacks. Bitcoin transactions, for example, are assigned transaction IDs by hashing their contents. You can manipulate certain types of information that go into the signature hashes in order to draw money from the paying account, but make it appear to them that it hasn't gone through. The receiver still gets their money, but the idea is that the sender can be tricked into spending twice. The first large-scale example of this being uh, used was the exchange Mt. Gox with BTC, and Mt. Gox actually had to file for bankruptcy as a result. Sybil attacks are named after Sybil Dorset, a patient with dis dissociative identity disorder. They typically involve tape taking over or creating multiple dishonest nodes in a blockchain network, and in the context of blockchain, these often take the form of 51% attacks, wherein a hacker controls 51% of hashing power and can therefore do pretty much whatever they want with the blockchain. So-called long-range attacks can be used to attack proof-of-stake networks by stealing or purchasing private keys with access to lots of coins, and a good history of minting slash validating that can be used to create alternative blockchain history and gain more rewards that way. Now, let's talk about how people attack user wallets. This type of attack is pervasive and you'll need to be out on the lookout for these. Blockchains, as described in part one, are a pretty secure technology. You, however, are a flesh and blood fallible person. And as such, you are oftentimes the weak link in the network. A lot of everyday blockchain attacks are attacks on the users, not the blockchain. This is done by more mundane means like phishing and by more involved means like hacking cold wallets. Phishing is a pretty well-known term at this point. An attacker tries to get sensitive information on you by literally just asking you to input it on a website or something that on its surface seems legit. This may literally be one of these emails you get where you've been selected to receive free coins or that you've randomly won a prize and all you have to do is log into your wallet with the link below. Naturally, the link below does not go to the standard login page and you're just giving them your info. Please don't do this, guys. You didn't randomly win free money. Do not pass go. Do not collect $200. iotaseed.io uh, got taken down in 2018 by a phishing campaign that stole over $4 million in IOTA from users. Dictionary attacks are where hackers basically go through the dictionary and try disappointingly common simple passwords like password. For the love of God, don't make your wallet password password or something stupid like that. And if one of your previous passwords has been compromised online, which various services allow you to see, uh, try not to use a variation of that. A simple way of generating a memorable password that can be, still be strong is to basically take a phrase like, Stacy's mom has got it going on and then just pepper that with numbers and special characters like the percent sign, dollar sign, at sign, etc., whatever. If a website allows you to use 8 to 16 characters, use 16 characters. Uh, avoid using full words and or special characters. You can remember the skeleton of the string because it's from a common language phrase, but you can make it secure against dictionary attacks by replacing letters with other characters. Shout out to Edward Snowden for this one. These are the main user side attacks that you can potentially defend against. Other attacks like cold slash hot wallet attacks, um, taking advantage of vulnerable signatures or flawed key generation code, are a bit more technical and can be difficult or even impossible to defend against yourself. 
They're rarer, but sometimes you're just crossing your fingers, like you're doing anytime you put your sensitive information on a website or you make a private password. All you can do on your end is make a strong password and keep it safe. The rest is on other people. The next broad category of attacks is smart contract attacks. These are typically carried out by exploiting vulnerabilities in smart contract code uh, or in virtual machines that run that code. All of these are pretty darn technical and beyond the scope of this video. There's also transaction verification attacks, which generally stem from exploiting the delay in verifying a transaction, which in a blockchain requires a consensus of multiple other nodes, either mining or minting. The goal is often to have the same coin spent twice. Reintroducing that double spending problem Satoshi was talking about in the Bitcoin white paper. A race attack, for instance, is where an attacker creates two transactions that rip off one party. The first transaction is a typical payment for service or a good or something like that. If things go according to plan, the receiver will act before waiting for full confirmation, then sends a product or something. The second transaction basically returns the money to the attacker and invalidates the first one. Then finally, there's mining pool attacks. So with the current intensity of Bitcoin mining, it's really hard for an individual with a single machine to make much profit, which necessitates large groups of people join, joining their hashing power into a pool that shares the load and the resultant rewards. By taking control of these pools, attackers can do things like selfish mining slash block withholding and variations like forking after withholding. Selfish mining is where you attackers use pools, mining or minting power to mine blocks that they don't broadcast to the network for a period before releasing several blocks at once, which causes other miners to lose their blocks. And there you go. That's pretty much all I have to say about vulnerabilities. You'll want to look elsewhere if you want a more technical look at them. So we covered a pretty massive amount of information just now, and we barely scratched the surface of any of it. So most people at this point will probably be wondering, how am I supposed to use this information? At this point, I'm just going to lay down a loose philosophy of how one might incorporate crypto into your portfolio and how about it, how to think about this stuff as a whole. Of note, I'm not going to go into depth on the terminology outside the crypto space in this part. If you'd like more details on personal fi finance, please feel free to check out my previous Let's Learn on personal finance. I'm going to assume you understand these basics going forward. So a lot of the fundamentals of investing in stocks, in my mind, apply to crypto investments. In fact, some of them apply even more. Don't invest money in crypto that you can't afford to lose. Don't invest money you think you'll need soon. Don't invest in an individual asset because you think it's going to the moon in the next week or two. Yeah, I know that ruins the fun, but you got to be responsible. But there's also some rules that are somewhat harder to apply. In the stock market, the safest long-term option is, as you know, index funds and ETFs. Most portfolio managers can't beat the S&P 500 over decades, and 99% of people shouldn't even try. The smart retail investor or non-institutional investor invests in broad, passively managed funds that automatically diversify their money and allow them to dollar cost average into the market without having to keep their finger on the pulse of the NYSE. In crypto, we're only just now getting crypto ETFs. Or, I mean, right now, like right now as I'm recording, we don't even have that yet. But the SEC is looking them over and we think they're probably going to, uh, you know, uh, prove some. And so far, they have no track record whatsoever. We don't know how crypto ETFs are going to perform in comparison to simply holding BTC, which itself has been the best performing asset of the last decade, including stock ETFs. So for the most part, people who are into crypto right now are investing in individual coins almost exclusively. You don't want to invest in individual stocks, but you pretty much have to invest in individual cryptos, pending those crypto ETFs becoming broadly available. Traditionally, stocks are considered the risky investments. This is in the context of stocks, bonds, cash, the assets most normal people hold. There's also real estate and commodities, but fewer people hold those. 
these days, crypto is the risk it, riskiest asset class to own, and you have to respect that. Not using money that you can't lose is even more important than crypto. It's for disposable cash only. If you're just starting out and you either don't feel like becoming well-versed in the crypto world, or you want to take your time and learn along the way, but you do want to get your feet wet, it's likely safest to start DCAing into BTC and ETH, the top two cryptos by market cap. BTC, as I've emphasized multiple times already, is the best performing and most proven asset in the space. ETH is the quintessential generation two crypto with institutional adoption and network effects that dwarfs all other gen twos. How you split that is going to be titrated to your risk tolerance. In my mind, 90% BTC and 10% ETH is for someone in this situation who's on the lower end of risk tolerance. And 90% ETH and 10% BTC is for those on the higher end of risk tolerance. And you could really go anywhere in between those extremes or even more extreme than that. I'll concede this does bring up the idea of whether volatility is equivalent to risk. In my opinion, it does not. And a lot of what I just said is not quite right in, with regard to, you know, the use of the term risk. There's some nuance to what exactly we mean when we say risk or volatility, but we can talk about that another time. Now, if you're going to invest in altcoins, coins other than BTC, that is, although I really don't think it makes sense to continue including ETH as an altcoin anymore, because I feel like that comes from a BTC maximalist perspective, you can't afford to not know what you're doing. You can't afford to be a passive investor. You can blindly DCA into an S&P 500 dividend ETF without knowing anything at all about the market, and I'd say that's fairly responsible. You can't really do that with random altcoins. You need to do your own research always. Research from multiple sources. Don't just trust the numbers your favorite content creator on YouTube gives you. Look at them yourself and decide if you agree. Read the white papers. If I sit here and tell you Cardano is the future, and it's going straight to the moon, uh, which it is, you can't take my word for it. Lots of these people talking online are full of it. Lots of them are just saying things for the clicks and views. Look at factors like what I mentioned above. Social engagement, institutional demand, market cap, and the implications for upside potential. Use cases. Look at transaction volume and volume trends. Correlation with v BTC number of exchanges it's listed on, etc. And remember, once you've done initial research, always keep up to date on the development team's roadmap and follow news on each coin you're invested in. The outlook for a given coin may look bright one day and become dismal another day as market circumstances change. This also has implications for how many different coins you might feel comfortable putting money in. You can't overextend yourself in the altcoin market or you may be asking for losses. It's not too hard to follow just ETH and BTC. Following MANA, ETH, BTC, OVR, VET, ADA, DOGE, and ICP is much harder. As you're following your coin's price action, don't let yourself forget your fundamental assessment. If the fundamentals are there, a dip is simply a discount, and the paper hands are losing money by selling. If the fundamentals are borderline to begin with or have changed in some material way, like for instance countries start banning miners of a coin or something, you may reassess your position or not. Limiting your losses often means that you bought high and sold low. So if you do end up doing that, be sure beforehand. Conversely, don't FOMO into the top of a pump and dump. If you hear about some trending coin that's going parabolic, and has experienced a bunch of its expected near-term gains, don't just throw all your money into it and try to ride the wave up. Do the research first. Invest at an appropriate price, which often means waiting for the parabola to even out and start going down, which, by the way, may mean potentially waiting months, maybe even years, before it starts shooting up again, if it does. Understand that these altcoins, short to midterm price actions, at least for now, are pegged pretty heavily to the value of BTC. They all go down when BTC does. B BTC has halvings, where mining rewards are halved and supply is constricted. 
and these occur roughly every four years, and its price tends to soar after these before encountering a so-called blow-off top, after which its value plummets, which gives us the wildly volatile four-year cycles we've been seeing in crypto markets until now. Investing in altcoins intelligently requires a basic knowledge of how BTC works. The entire crypto market is currently dominated by BTC, to the point where one important indicator you'll hear people talk about is literally called percent BTC dominance, the percent of the total crypto market that lies in BTC alone. Even if you don't much care for or hold BTC, BTC is central to the cryptocurrency's trading model in 2021. So say that you've done your research, you know what you want to invest in, you've got some disposable cash, and you're ready to jump in. Where do you buy? What's your trading strategy? My answer is uh, yes. There's a bunch of crypto exchanges you can buy from. BlockFi, Coinbase, Coinbase Pro, which is a deceptive name because it's free, eToro, Kraken, Robinhood if you're a scrub. Pick one. They each have their own ups and downs. I accidentally started on Robinhood and have more money on there than I intended because Ethereum Classic blew up, so I guess I'll keep some of my ETC there for now. I mainly use Coinbase these days. BlockFi allows you to get interest off of certain coins. eToro gives you certain automatic tra trading options. Pick one, or m multiple. If you're really into a certain coin, you might just be going for an exchange that has that coin at the lowest price. You can use more than one exchange, possibly leveraging their disparate prices for what's called crypto arbitrage, where you buy coins on a cheaper exchange and sell them on an exchange that has a higher value to pocket the difference. You can get into mining proof-of-work coins. You can get really into yield farming, whatever. I personally approach crypto trading kind of how I approach stock trading. You want solid fundamentals and a long-term investing horizon. For crypto, you should also factor in public engagement. Buy low, sell high. Stay on top of the news cycle for any individual asset you buy. Nothing complicated. When the FUD rains and the market dips, you buy more heavily into your strongest convictions. When things are going parabolic in the altcoin market and you reach your predetermined price target, you sell out of your position to realize gains instead of greedily holding out for the top of the mountain. People thought Bitcoin was done growing at 1,000. They were wrong. They thought 10,000 was a respectable end to its growth. They were wrong. But if you only looked at these prices in the short term, which sometimes meant multiple months, you might have thought they were right. Those who believed in the fundamentals held to their convictions and have multiplied their money the most. Now, if something fundamental were to change about Bitcoin moving forward, you'd want to know about that. Not that that's really happened much since its inception, but if it did, or more likely something like that happened to another coin like, say, Ethereum, you gotta know the news as early as possible and potentially make adjustments. And of course, as I said in the previous video, if you're 70, maybe stick mostly to bonds. And if you're 20, maybe take a bit more risks with uh, more stocks and crypto. But like I said, that's not financial advice, that's just me. And that brings us to the end of the video. If you like the video, don't forget to comment, like, subscribe, share, as it really helps the channel. If you hated it, go ahead and give it a big thumbs down. As always, I'll see you in the next video. Stay learning, my friends.